good morning, good morning, and good evening to you from the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center in the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. I'm Professor Boyd Craig, and with my co-host and co-professor, Lord Michael Hastings, we warmly welcome you to the World's Principled Leaders Series. You know, the world today, more than ever, needs leaders worthy of trust, who know how to get things done, and who do it by growing great leaders around them. Our guest today is one such leader, one of the finest and most empowering I've ever known. Retired United States Navy Captain David Marquet, former commander of the USS Santa Fe nuclear submarine. Our warmest welcome to you, David. So good to see you again. Thank you. Is that my cue to start? That's wonderful. Well, David, you've had such a great career of exemplary influence from a commander in the United States Navy to now teaching leaders and organizations around the world how to lead in a new way. Would you please share with us your story and introduce our students and guests to your compelling leadership model? Yeah, uh, ha happy to. So what I'm planning on doing is about 15 minutes worth of visual storytelling and then about 15 minutes worth of a interactive con conversation. Uh, but I wanna, I wanna start with this picture here. So this is me, that's Stephen Covey. And the fact that this picture exists, Stephen Covey on a nuclear submarine talking with this person is, is a testament to the serendipity of life and a testament to being able to, to really rethink what our mission and what our roles are and, and to believe in that without any expectation that that, that would happen. I mean, the, the, the likelihood that this picture exists in 10,000 universes is that may exist in one or two universes. And so what I wanna talk about is how, how did this come to being and what was the impact? Now, I want to start with my own story. Uh, so this group of happy people, that's me right there. You can see I'm a little bit awkward. I can't even look at the camera. We're dressed awkwardly because it's the 1970s and we had to wear these clothes. And this was the math team. So in the United States, we call it the math team where we go and compete against other schools doing algebra and calculus problems. And it's where all the geeks, it's designed so the geeks and introverts could go there and feel like they had a place. And so that was, that was me. I was, I was hung out with the geeks and the introverts. But we were in the Cold War. I felt passionately about liberal democracy, about a world where people could choose their profession, their religion, their spouse, and how they wanted to live. And I believe that was represented by the values of the West in the Cold War. And so I went and I did my thing, which was to sign up for a submarine. Now, if, you're, if you look like this in high school and you're an introvert and a geek, going to the military is scary, but the submarines hide from people. And so my decision was to go be a submariner. And I went with the dream of being a submarine commander. And I showed up at the Annapolis uh, Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. And, and the United States government gives me this book and it says leadership can be defined as directing the thoughts, plans, and actions of others. Not, not, not directing their actions, not directing their plans and actions, but directing their thoughts, plans, and actions. And I took that and I ran with it. And I said, oh, that's good. I'm smarter than everyone. I see things faster than them. I see the problem quicker and I see the solution faster. And I started going to organization to organization, moving up the ranks, fixing things. I got a reputation for being the person to take over a failed organization and fix it. And I thought I was doing great. But when I would leave, if I, looked, if I cared to look behind me, what would happen? The organization would go back to the way it was. Performance would regress. But that was just simply more proof of what a great leader I was. I was assigned to be a nuclear submarine commander, which was my dream job. I never thought that I would get the opportunity to do it. And it was a bit of a rocky road, but eventually I made it through all the wickets and I was assigned to take command of one submarine, which I spent 12 months learning 
Now, if this is your leadership definition, the idea is the unspoken assumptions are the leader knows all the answers. And the leader is the source of decision making for the team. And after that 12 months of studying for one submarine, I got shifted to a different submarine. The Santa Fe, which was the worst performing submarine in the fleet, and the captain had quit abruptly without notice. And that's why I got shifted the very last minute. Now the key was the Santa Fe was a different kind of submarine than the one I'd been studying for 12 months. Different reactor plant, drove through the ocean differently because for hydrodynamics were different, different missiles, different. And yet I'm supposed to be the one that tells everyone what to do. And there, fortunately, I didn't have a lot in my control. Now you may think, oh, nuclear submarine commander, that's a pretty powerful person. I couldn't control who was on the team, what positions they were in, our resources, and the operational schedule. All these things were dictated to me. Every, all 50 submarines in, in the fleet, people go to the same schools, same uh, professional development, same group of people. The Navy made these decisions. The benefit was, was I didn't spend any energy on any of these things. I spent all my energy on the one thing I could control, which was the way we talked to each other, starting with myself. But because I didn't know the submarine, the way I felt inside was more like this. And, but I didn't, I didn't share that, right? You don't, share vulnerability when you're a nuclear submarine commander. <laughs> no, no, we wouldn't do that. It, it all, it lasted about two weeks, this facade. This is the control room of the submarine. And we did this exercise where we were gonna run on a backup motor. We're shutting down the reactor, pretending there's a problem. And I gave an order that didn't make any sense. I, I gave an order, I, well, actually I suggested an order that we shift into second gear, even, even though, unbeknownst to me, because all the older submarines had two gears on this motor, but this one only had one, the Santa Fe is one of the newest submarines. And the sailor makes this funny face, he doesn't say anything. And then I, I noticed it and I said, hey, what's going on? I says, captain on the Santa Fe is only one speed motor. There is no second gear. And my whole notion of leadership blew up. Because if your idea of leadership is the leader is the one who's making decisions and motivating the team and telling them what to do, and you do make a bad decision like I did here, well, the obvious answer, the obvious response is you got to make better decisions. And so we spend time honing our own decision-making ability. And, and the model is I decide what you should do. And I realized that this was a, not the most effective model for me because there was no way for me to learn the complexity of a nuclear submarine in any kind of a time frame that we would still be alive in. I needed the team to tell me what we needed to do. And so the problem wasn't I made a bad decision. The problem was I was making decisions. And so I told the, told the guys who made a deal, hey, what if I never give another order? And they're like, better than dying, <laughs> but we've never seen that. We don't know what it looks like. And I said, so here's the deal. I will lean back and I will stop telling you guys what to do, but you have to lean forward into me. Our normal model of leadership is we're all managing below us. We're managing the people. I'm, I'm leading people. This is wrong. What you want, it's a waste of time. What you want to do is lean back, let, let the team lead themselves. And if anything, they're leading you. And I had, I just, I'm going to go through three quick lessons, uh, reframes of how I viewed the world. Number one, it's always you. And we want to say, oh, well, you should do this, or you should be motivated. Eat, like, these innocuous things. I motivate my team. No, you don't. You don't motivate anybody. Maybe in the short term, you provoke someone to action. You're not really creating, do any of you people need motivation? No. 
Motivation comes from within. We get out of the way of people who are already motivated. And if there's any problem, it's you. The only person whose behavior you can affect is your own. As an example, you want a learning organization, you need to say the words, I don't know. Not give a lecture on being a learning organization. You just need to practice the humility of not, not thinking you know all the answers. Number two, language is so powerful. It's, it is the tool. If you're a carpenter, you use saws, hammers, and screwdrivers. If you're a coder, you use the code language that you're in. If you're a leader, you use language. And over and over, over again, we would say, what would it sound like if? And we had, we had Stephen's book. And I would say, well, what would it sound like if everyone acted proactively? Not give a lecture on proactivity and empowerment, but just what would it sound like? What would people say? What would the one-on-one -on -one conversation sound like? Well, how would the meeting start? If I'm not there and the meeting schedule started noon, what happens? What would it sound like? One of the most powerful things was we changed from a culture of they to we. We had all these they's. They's, but every, every organization I see this, ranks. Well, they, sometimes it's the union, non-union. Sometimes it's uh, leaders and management, doctors and nurses, whatever it happens to be. And then we have ranks by department. We have, and it's they. Well, they didn't do, they, they, they. And we just said, you know what? We're not gonna say that word anymore. We're gonna say the word we. It just sounds funny. Well, we didn't order the wrong, right part. You can't, there's no blame. And what happens is your brain grows the connections so that when you see those people in the other departments and the other levels of hierarchy, it feels like we but the action comes first. And finally, if you really want to be your best and live your best life, you need to invoke, in my mind, what I call care, don't care. You got to care deeply and passionately about the mission and the people that have been entrusted to you. But you can't care about the political consequences to you or who gets the credit or am I in the meeting when I feel like I should be? All those things, those are just distractors. And they're going to hold you back. That, that sense of, oh, I need to prove myself or I, 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 I need to find room for myself. And then when you get over all that, you can do amazing things in the short run. We're bringing a, a SEAL team onto the helicopter, uh, uh, from the helicopter onto the submarine. And this person back here, they're gonna have to make all these decisions. It's so noisy, it's so quick. They, there's no time to say, well, what should I do? And then for me, I'm up here on the sail. I can't even see what's going on. But our, our leadership, whole leadership philosophy that that we kind of grew up with is based on managing visual physical work from the industrial revolution. But more importantly, over the next 10 years, more, more submarine commanders came from this one submarine, 10 of them, 10 submarine commanders. But it took a long time for that to play out. Most organizations don't have the patience for that. And they don't keep track of things like that. Well, why is it that 20% of all our submarine commanders came from one submarine. What kind of Kool-Aid are they drinking? And so at the end, I got a phone call or in, in the middle of this whole thing, I got a phone call saying Dr. Covey would, he was doing some stuff for the Navy and he heard about the story and he wanted to come out and we were, we picked him up off of uh, Lahaina, Maui and it's one of these crystal clear, beautiful days and we got underway and everything just worked. And we had all these family members on board, which I was really nervous about, but it was amazing. And he spoke to the families and the dolphins were jumping off the bow of the submarine. And it was a magic day for me. And it was a magic day for the crew and the families. And we developed um, 
It was more than, than a social visit. We, we developed something which I think is very, very important, which we now call the ladder of leader, leadership, which is a way of listening to people and then inviting them to higher levels of empowerment. And you can, uh, there's a website, ladderofleadership.com, if you want to look it up and take a screenshot here. Uh, but the idea is we move people gradually, we invite them, that's the word. We invite people gradually to greater levels of engagement, of thinking, but also vulnerability. And that's why saying, well, no, I used to tell you what to do here. Now you tell me what we should do. That's generally a step too far. So I'm gonna pause there and see what kind of thoughts I've provoked in you guys with this story. Tremendous story, David. Uh, immediate question is, as you step back in the, in the personal leadership crisis you were in where you were responsible to lead this sub, but didn't know everything and were reliant on your crew, what happened when you leaned back, invited them to lean forward? What were the results? Yeah, so it, it depended on the, the person in the situation a little bit. But it, it, first of all, I had to keep biting my tongue. When you think you know the answer, it's what you want to do is, oh, I know the answer. I'll tell them and we'll do it and we'll make in progress. And it's, you're over biased towards doing and you're over biased towards making it about you. And what, we, what you really need to do is even when you think you know the answer, and this is the key, because early on it was easy. I knew I didn't know the answer. I said, well, hey, what do you guys think? Well, what should we do? What, what's the right way to handle it? And, but then later when I did know the answer, now it gets harder. I've seen this before. I know what's gonna happen. But I still would say, so why don't you guys spend 10 minutes and come up with a plan? Tell me what you think. Because you gotta, you're building leaders. And so for me, what happens is people are initially, some people are like, yeah, man, get out of the way. Here's what I intend to do. Here's why I'm doing it. Here's how we're making it safe. Here's what I intend to do. Here's why we're doing it. Here's why I'm making it safe. And you gotta spend more time. It turns out there's a lot more in your head than you've shared with the team. You don't realize. And so I'd have to spend time saying, okay, so now here's what we're trying to achieve. Now, how would you do that? Here's what we're trying to achieve. And then the other thing was I had to new, learn a new, literally learn a new language, a language of uncertainty and vulnerability. You watch all these movies. No one says, well, the enemy could be there, but that's only really 80%, but they could actually be over there. It's like, no, the enemy's there, charge that hill. Yeah, maybe that's not the enemy. And so I had to learn a language of, if I did, once I did make a final decision to say, yeah, I'm like 80% sure about this. So if anyone sees that the enemy's really over that way, we really need to know fast. And, and being able to speak with vulnerability and uncertainty was very, um, it was, a, it was, a, it was it had to be, it was an acquired skill an acquired taste. And it never, I never really got super, I would never say I got comfortable with it, but I saw the impact because if I acted certain and confident, do this, keep selling DVDs. That's what we're going to do. Then the bit, the chance that someone would stand up and say, you know what, there's this thing called streaming. We seem to be going out of business because of these guys st standing up and saying that is just really significantly reduced. And if you want someone to say that, hey, I think we're about to shoot the wrong target. Hey, I don't think 737 Max software is really ready for prime time. Hey, I don't think cheating on diesel uh, on these Volkswagen diesels is really a good, if you want people to say that, it starts with you demonstrating humility uns uh, and uncertainty. You know, many leaders would fear that if they show vulnerability, if they say, I don't know, that they'll lose their power, they'll lose their credibility. Did you find that? I, I I do hear that a lot. For some reason, I didn't I didn't sense that because, well, the first time I had to say I don't know, it was very very scary for me. But then when I said it, it was it was like I mean the the the, the team I took over knew I was 
had been selected for a different submarine. They knew their submarine commander quit and they knew I was airdropped in on them. So they, so when I just acknowledged what everybody knew, it was like, oh yeah, this guy's gonna be taught, tell the truth. And I let them say, I, 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 I don't know. But for me, it was like, maybe something about like in the military, we have rank that's very visible. So I really wasn't worried hmm. that people would like not do, if I, in fact, if I, in, in the rare occasions when I said, I need you guys to do this right now, they were more adherent because, I, oh, he must be serious now. He's really telling us hmm. he needs us to do something. Yeah. Um, but I, I think like we have this cultural thing which links this, um, it's, I call it cotton candy leadership. It, it's like we're feeding people cotton candy because it feels good for the minute, for the moment. Like, I feel good. All these people lined out outside my room. I feel good being the person making decisions. And there's some wiring that, that, that rewards that. And uh, it, it trick, it's, it's your brain tricking you for what really is important. And, and you got to tame that down. You know, many leaders that I know uh, have a unspoken but real fear that if they give up control, then results are going to go out the window. There, there, <laughs> something like something bad's going to happen if I give up on that rain. Right. How do you get the inner security and courage to take the step to let go? And what's the external motivator? to actually do it. So that's well, a two part question inside and then outside. Yeah, so we're, we, we never convince people. We, I, I don't go around convincing uh, as, as a businessman saying, oh, you need this and you should act this way. And um, I'm gonna convince you because it, it, what we get, so, so the CEO of an organization calls me up and he or she says, yeah, a lot of my people are talking about this book they're reading and, and uh, we're thinking about bringing you in and I uh, convinced me that it's going to work. I'm like, yeah, no, it's not going to work. <laughs> like, do you believe, like, what, how do you believe in, what do you believe about people? Do you, uh, do you believe that they can be inherently motivated, that they want to come to work and do the right thing? That if you stop telling them what to do, they would just sit around and not do anything. Well, yeah, maybe, but that's because you conditioned them to just do what you tell them all the time. The problem is always you. And we have, and, and we, we have hard conversations about that. Oh, my people don't speak up in a meeting. I order them to. Like, yeah, about that. So fortunately, we don't, we don't try and convince people. There's enough people on the planet who believe that that that's a better way to live your life. And I can't remember part B of your storyline. Oh, oh, sorry. So here's the thing. You have to practice this. And so what, what I would do, uh, and, and soon hopefully we can do this again. Every time you go to a restaurant, don't give practice giving up control to the server. Don't order. Let the server choose for you or see if you can get the server to choose for you. And that, so you don't even know what your meal is until they put it in front of you. So the, so the problem with leadership and leadership development is that we spend too much time talking about, like, give me actions. It, it's a sport. It's, it's learning a language. So you got to practice. And so go and pra just practice it. Do it 10 times. And then you'll feel the anxiety of not knowing exactly what you get. And you'll understand what it takes for that person to make a decision for you, which in a nutshell is they have to feel safe to make that decision. But it won't be a theoretical experiment. It'll be you actually practicing it. Oh. And then what happens is you're going to have amazing experience. You're going to have meals. You're going to see people's faces light up. <laughs> I, I had one executive. He said, the server paid more attention to our water glasses. And I could just see he was like bus. He was like sort of whatever that table, that table. And he would come with excitement and enthusiasm to our table. And that will reinforce for you. And you'll feel like, oh my gosh, I had such an amazing experience. I would have never had it if I just ordered the normal thing. For me, Caesar salad with grilled chicken. 
That's what I would order four hundred three three or six five days a year. It's such amazing. Yeah, it's these amazing experience, and you see that literally the faces light up, and then you're like, oh, now I can do it at work. Powerful, Lord Hastings. Please ask uh, what's on your mind. David, thank you. And I want to take you back to your opening image, which is that you said the U.S. tells you that leadership is about, and then you gave a series of words. And the first one was thoughts. And did your experience uh, in the commanding position you were in over the years you were in, did you see people come to think like you? and to think in a certain way. And how do you influence their thoughts? Yeah, so, the, yeah, I think so, because what happened was, the phrase we use is we act our way to new thinking. So for example, if you want people to feel empowered, I want my team to feel a sense of empowerment and ownership. Most, most corporate leaders will, will, will say that. And what happens is we will then implement a change program that starts with, I'm going to change belief and then actions will somehow follow. And I think it's actually the reverse that what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to practice empowerment and that by practicing. So, so what does that mean? Again, what would it sound like? Well, when you come to me, instead of saying, I'd like permission to do this or sending an email that says, uh, if I like permission, in other words, if I don't hear yes, the answer is no to, Hey, this is what I intend to do. Next week, I'm going to meet with a client. I'm intending to offer this program. Next week, we're scheduled to launch our, our new, new product. I intend to whatever, which means if I don't hear anything, the answer is yes. I own it, in other words. And so, and then you just do that for six months, and now you feel empowered. It's like your brain just magically adapted to it. So for me, I mean, I, I think you can affect people's thinking, but it's sort of in a long, circuitous route. The way the way I interpreted that leadership definition was basically you should order people to think a certain way and somehow they'll like, you, you, you know, you've heard this, like, Oh, it must be easy to be a leader in the military. You just tell people what to do. It's like, Oh, okay, great. So sure. <laughs> I order you to be innovative. I order you to be creative. I order you to be motivated. I order you to be engaged. Obviously that doesn't work. Do you feel when you had run your time, that that you had grown more as a leader than what you ever thought was possible in class. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because I look, there is no reason why I should have ever met Stephen Covey in my life. There is no reason why I should have been a nuclear submarine commander. Really, I was just this kid from Massachusetts who was a on scared kid who was on the math team. And, uh, and I think there was this weird sort of uh, dissatisfaction with, I mean, as I was coming up through the ranks, I, I kind of chafed it. Well, no, no, I was, I'd have ideas and they were like, no, 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 Mark, hey, we're not really, in, I'd be like the guy, well, why? No, 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 you don't understand. I, I wouldn't read the clues in the room that, <laughs> This is not a discussion, even though it pretend to be a discussion. Mm -hmm. And then, and, um, and so when I got there, I was just like, well, I'm, it, it's like you get this chance that you don't really think you were gonna have in life. And I was able to go all in. I'm like, what are they gonna do? Fire, I, like, I'd rather be fired in two weeks for doing what I think is right than have three years in my job and of, of kissing up and playing the system and being you know, slightly better than mediocre. And uh, by the end, I realized, I learned a bunch of things. We, we did a bunch of things wrong, so we, we, we adjusted and, and changed course. But one of the things I started thinking about near the end was, it, it's, even though I was trying to remove myself as a personality from the, the decision-making, I was still integral to the creating the culture. I was the cultural ambassador, so to speak. And I was faced with, well, I'm going to leave. So I need to create a way, mechanisms whereby the culture lives on absent 
me. And that, that, that was another level of, of um, maturity for me. Thank you, Professor Craig, back to you. Yes. Well, uh, David, uh, in our conversations and in my study of your work, there are some pretty special shifts that took place inside of you. One is that you went from thinking that your job was to get things done to my job is to produce leaders. And it shifted your thinking. And your, your sub went from the worst performing sub in the fleet to the top performing in the whole fleet. So as you look at these young people in front of you, whose lives are ahead of them, who want to make a difference, who want to be good leaders, what would your closing words to them be? Well, leadership is hard. It's a choice. No one's going to force you to be a leader. If you make that choice, it's going to be at the cost of your own self-interest because you're not going to be a leader and then be, be able to take care of yourself so much. The team will take care of you automatically. And so for me, if I'm talking to the CEO of an organization, it, th that person has the authority. I say, you got, you know, the idea is give authority, let people expose or give people the opportunity to reveal what they know. Hmm. Let them reveal their passions. And it doesn't come from, well, once you reveal your passions, I'll then give you more authority. That's the backwards way to think about it. But if you're on the underside of that equation, don't expect someone to give you authority if you play, well, I, I'm not gonna reveal my thinking. I, I get nervous when I expose what I'm thinking, my inchoate thoughts and that are not fully formed. I, I, I don't like criticism. I don't, I don't wanna be vulnerable that way. You, no one's gonna give you authority. What you need to do is expose your thinking. I would just go to my boss and say, hey, here's how I'm thinking about this. Help, help me with my thinking. Don't, don't solve my problem, but am I thinking about it right? Improve my thinking over and over and over again. And then that will earn you more authority, whether it's in the, formally in terms of, hey, we're going to give you an, uh, an advancement or you just start getting invited to the, to the meetings because they're going to understand that you're, you're improving your thinking and you're improving the people's thinking around it. It's, and we, we call it ex, expose your thinking. And so many people don't do it. And it feels scary. It's your brain, again, tricking you to do the wrong thing. Well, David, your story, our session with you today, and your life and leadership have given us much to think about. We're so grateful. Uh, and so uh, to our audience, uh, we're so pleased you could join us. This is the world's principled leader series. Hope to have you back soon.